All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our BHAC uh, monthly webinar. My name is Kat Marriott. I'm the Executive Director of Building Healthy Academic Communities. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. Um, a week later than originally planned, but uh, we definitely appreciate you joining, joining us today. Just a few uh, BHAC reminders. Um, the National Wellness Challenge is still going on. We are still um, holding the National Wellness Challenge. We have extended the deadline for submitting your, um, your campus's uh, creative wellness programs until April 15th. So if you have, um, have completed a interesting or innovative wellness program this winter and you'd like to submit that to us, please do so. You can check out the guidelines at healthyacademics.org slash resources. Our next webinar is going to be April 15th at two o'clock. And uh, the subject of the webinar is texting as a health promotion method. You can join uh, Lisa Barlage and Patricia Brinkman from Ohio State University as they share um, their research study um, utilizing texting as a health promotion method. We want to enjoy, uh, invite you as always to become a BHAC member. Well, at BHAC, we provide our members with many opportunities to share best practices, resources, networks, and health and wellness ideas with uh, from one campus to another. Um, you can learn more at healthyacademics.com slash membership. And for those of you who are joining us today and are seeking continuing education credit, uh, please remember that you need to complete the, uh, the survey at the end of the webinar. The survey will be open for uh, one week. And um, so please um, complete that, that survey in order to receive your continuing education credit. One other reminder, um, the uh, Building Healthy Academic Communities holds a, our national summit every other year. And so thankfully it is not this year, otherwise we would be talking about rescheduling. But um, next, next year in 2021, the um, Building Healthy Academic Summit will be at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, April 21st through 23rd. And uh, we are working on our agenda and identifying keynote speakers and all of the interesting topics. If you are interested in getting involved in the planning and would like to share your ideas, your input regarding speakers and topic areas, please contact us. We would love to, to have you join our planning committee. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to our webinar hosts today. Karen Mueller and Chris Meehan from Horan Associates, and they're gonna to talk to you today about creating a healthier campus for all. We practice this. <laughs> oh, it's coming, there we go. Great. Well, thanks, Kat. Um, we wanted to, uh, you know, just introduce ourselves to start with. Uh, my name's Chris Meehan. Um, I usually do not have a beer, but I'm staying home virtually, so uh, that's a new new thing for me. And and Karen Mueller, my colleagues, can kick us off. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Karen Mueller, and uh, we are thrilled to have the opportunity to uh, to share some time with you this afternoon. Um, as I said, I'm Executive Vice President at Haran. And we are, you know, very focused on campus health and want to share just a few ideas and information with you this afternoon. So the first thing, Chris, you want to move the slides along, please? I am, as soon as I uh, figure out how to do that. Yes, I'm working from my home office and Chris working from his is, uh, may present a couple little challenges, but we're going to make it through there. So that's what we look like in real life. 
not our, not our home life. That's right. Do you want to, do you want to, can we get rid of our pictures here? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, well, good afternoon, everyone. You know, you're probably wondering who is Haran? Um, you know, and why are we speaking to you today? Well, first of all, Haran is a healthcare and benefit consulting firm doing business for over 70 years in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, as you can see from the slides that, um, that we're presenting here, we have clients in 48 states. We manage and work with over 600 employee um, employers and you know, translating to over a half a million individuals that come to us for trusted advice. As you can see, looking at the map, there are only two states that we are not in, and we are happy to go to North Dakota or South Dakota should duty call. Um, most importantly, I think it's, you know, for the purpose of this presentation this afternoon, is to know the impact that we have on higher education. Uh, Haran currently impacts approximately 67,000 students and about 12,000 employees. Next question. A little bit of a so one of the things that Haran is is really focused on is trying to be a leader in, in this space and in spaces in healthcare in general. So our goal is to champion bold innovation backed up by data to help students and universities thrive. As I said, our mission is to be on the forefront of the trends that we're seeing emerging, and to be able to provide these insights, ideas, guidance, and resources to help our clients establish and maintain a total campus of health. So basically working with such a diverse group of individuals, it's important to understand um, you know, who our clients are, where to meet them, uh, and where to meet them uh, where they're, you know, versus forcing them to adapt to one way of communication and education that globalize for all. So here's what we know today about traditional students. Um, we're dealing mostly with the Generation Z, uh, the largest generation in American history, quite frankly. Um, they grew up with digital technology, you know, since a young age, um, very comfortable with the internet, social media. Uh, there was a 2014 study uh, called Generation Z Goes to College and uh, it found that most Gen Z students self-identify as being loyal, open-minded, they're very fast learners, they're very financially focused, they're really worried about that price tag. You know, another couple interesting facts, um, the average Gen Z uh, got their first smartphone just before their 12th birthday. I think I got mine when I was 22. Um, not even smartphone, just cell phone in general. Um, you know, they prefer streaming services to, uh, instead of traditional cable getting very snackable content that's very important for this presentation that they can get on their phones or their computers. Yeah, I think it's also interesting that uh, some of the things we've learned in terms of how students are most connected. Right now, Instagram is their most uh, favorable or popular media source, while their parents uh, are, are more prefer like the Facebook and some of those other, some of those other more outdated methods as we would see. Well, one of the things that, uh, you know, I think it's, we just want to have a little bit of fun here too. And, um, you know, Chris, knowing what we know, we need to catch up people's attention pretty quickly. So what we thought we would do for the audience today is play it, play a quick game. Uh, this game is called fact or myth. So we know the students are most interested in learning about health and wellness topics of interest. Quick response, Chris, Chris is that a fact or a myth? You know, Karen, with what I just mentioned um, about the Generation Z, I would have to say that's a fact. Well, actually, no, that's a myth. Um, so we, here's what we have learned. Uh, actions speak louder than words. You know, our data shows that when we did a general survey of students, uh, when they were trying to register onto a, this particular site, they said that they were interested in things like exercise, nutrition, stress, and back pain. But on the right side, you can see where they were actually, the actual topics that they were engaged in through gamification and research and learning modules. So they like the things like, you know, asthma, depression, uh, addiction, things that we probably caught us a little bit by surprise. 
especially if we were trying to just look at what people told us they were interested in, we probably would have gone down the wrong path compared to what they are actually showing interest in. Well, you know, what's very interesting. Um, I didn't really believe that Gen Z would be really interested in chronic diseases, um, you know, that are highlighted in red, um, you know, but really on top of their mind versus some of the other health and wellness things that they stated ongoing. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, I thought so too. And, you know, again, this is a, this is a, a genuine survey that we took from a university. And it's like, if these are the things that are weighing on students' minds, either for their self or for their family members, what can we do to help? All right, Karen, your turn. Um, I think I have a doozy for you. So fact or myth, people forget 50% of what a clinician tells them by the time they reach the parking lot. Well, Chris, uh, speaking for myself and, and my age group, um, I know, knowing how difficult it is to remember everything I'm being told while I have other questions that are just racing through my mind at the same time, I would have to say that's a fact. Karen, it's actually a myth. Um, you know, although 50% is very significant, uh, the actual percentage is much higher. It's 80%. Um, you know, making the need for reducing that forgetting curve uh, is actually even more important. Um, I don't understand the forgetting curve, Chris. Tell me, tell me a little bit about a little bit more about that, and what you know, what do we do? So this this really gets me because I, I have a master's and a in a in a bachelor's in psychology. Um, so you know, basically, this idea of the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve is over 100 years old. Uh, it originates in the late 19th century with German psychologist Herbert Ebbinghaus. Uh, he's actually one of the first scientists to perform experiments to understand how the memory works. So this is very unique uh, with regards to the Gen Z population and what they're going to want to need and know as they, uh, as they learn. His forgetting curve is basically a mathematical formula uh, that describes the rate at which something's forgotten after it's initially learned. So if, you, if the downslope of the forgetting curve can be softened by repeating that learned information at intervals, it's called spaced repetition. So it's more than just raw repetitions. It's not, um, you know, studying a new fact 15 times one hour. I tried that many in college and it just didn't work. You know, if the information is repeated at intervals uh, and using fun, interactive medium, game-based learning, something different than the traditional, uh, basically um, the brain must reconstruct that memory, strengthening it like a muscle. Well, that, that's, a, that's a lot of information, uh, Chris. <laughs> Thanks for that, but uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I know that some of those bullet points that are on the side of the slide there are different ways, obviously, that we would communicate and can help us with that learning experience. But uh, do me a favor and don't quiz me on everything that you just said right now. <laughs> yeah, sure, no problem. All right, it's my turn again. Fact or myth, 60% of the students say gamification is the most effective platform for learning. Well, what I would say, um, based on our student research, I would think uh, it would be a lot higher, but I'd say it's a fact. Chris, you're absolutely correct. As you can see, you know, through the power of technology and our partnership that we have with a uh, organization called EdLogix, here are a few stats that would demonstrate the power of learning and literacy through gamification. Uh, let's just look at the results. This is an actual campus. As you can see here, we have depression highlighted. And as you can see, the disease state and then the second col or the middle column there, student confidence. You know, in student confidence, people, the students that came into here felt like they had a pretty good understanding of depression. But by the time that they finished some of the learning modules or some of the gamification, they actually had increased their learning and understanding. Uh, but the knowledge improvement part of it was also had increased. So, you know, campuses are very, very good about providing information and access to resources as it relates to depression um, and stress and, and mental health. But it's always nice to see that the students also have an opportunity to learn more. The other thing about uh, that, that we looked at here was, um, was just the, the health insurance. You know, trust me, I have experienced this in some of the work that we've done on campus, but um, when you have students that are away from mom and dad for the first time and have never really experienced uh, what, how to deal with the health system or let alone insurance, uh, you can, as you can see, this was a, a, a hot topic for them. 
but they also were able the looking at their student the confidence when they came into the module at 2.63 and at the end of it they had they were at least 32% uh, more confident than they were when they started but their knowledge improvement had increased significantly so you're almost at 117% above where they started from and that's something that they'll be able to continue to at least have a base understanding for in ways that we might be able to ask more intelligent questions now that they have a better understanding of that. Yeah, when you look at some of the others too in red, um, you know, low back pain. You know, you think of folks that might be older, might be thinking about low back pain. Uh, you don't think the young and invincible generation of college students are thinking about low back pain. And, and what you see is their confidence level, you know, at the first part increased almost 20%. And it was another high level of knowledge improvement of understanding more about low back pain going from 54 all the way up to 99.6 after using the module is something uh, that, that really surprised me because I didn't think, uh, you know, college students were thinking about low back pain. You know, another one, again, sleep health. All right. So I know about you, but I didn't get much sleep in college. Uh, but one of the things, um, you know, students were, were able to understand was definitely the impact of alcohol had on their quality of sleep. You know, I know it took me a long time to realize that, uh, that I couldn't do a late night, expect to perform the next day. But I think by using this gamification and this, uh, you know, educational game-based learning, uh, we've definitely tried to close the gap on these kids right away on the sleep health. Well, you know, it's modules like this that help. I'm, I'm still like you, Chris, still trying to learn that one. <laughs> okay, final question, um, fact or myth? Um, in order for campuses to improve the overall health and well-being of their students, multiple data resources need to be utilized to create a total campus strategy. All right, Chris, that's kind of a gimme. Based on our experience, I think both, uh, uh, both of us know, as well as our audience, that that is a fact. You're right. That's a fact. So here's what we know. So what happens is you need to incorporate, we believe, four major components uh, that, that we have identified on this slide to really bring an overall total campus of health. You know, obviously the lifeline of the campus is the student population. It really means involving the entire community uh, with campus and community resources, appropriate resources, all working together in unity towards a common goal. Yeah, absolutely. So we have identified these four groups that are critical to total campus health. You know, as we said, students are the lifeline. So students need to be educated and engaged regarding the vision of the campus. Um, employees, staff, faculty also need to be educated and engaged in working to create that atmosphere and a culture and lead by example attitude that kind of aligns with the, student, with the campus mission, vision, and goals. And again, transferring that to the student population as well. The campus resources um, is another one of those key components. You know, the students and employees are offered easy access to these resources that have been identified. They've been trained to help close the gaps. So for an example of what that might, the student resources might be, would be the, like the health centers, some of the counseling services, and maybe some of the, uh, some of the student life programs that are out there, again, to engage students. And the fourth component is one that sometimes we forget about, is the community resource. You know, the community resource is supporting the residents and kind of bridging gaps between students, campus, and the community. So an example of how the community may come, become involved is maybe some volunteering opportunities. We do know that the Gen Zs like to volunteer and are socially responsible. Um, more comprehensive uh, medical care, so maybe the hospitals that are in the community. And also some of the mental health providers. Um, you know, sometimes the, the campuses need some additional resources beyond what is just offered through the counseling centers. Uh, so those are just a couple of the ideas that we have and kind of how we think that these are the four co components that must all work together to get that total campus health. Well, I tell you what, you definitely need the, the, all the right stakeholders uh, in the game and in and, and, and full blow. But Karen, how do you identify the gaps and actually the right resources that are needed? Well, Chris, intelligence gathering. And so what do we mean by intelligence gathering? Well, first of all, I think we have to identify who we believe the stakeholders are and what kind of information we're trying to gather. So obviously, we, you know, we have identified, we thought are the four uh, key components uh, to pulling together total campus health, but then gathering information from each of those resources. 
So the students, uh, the employees, the administration, and then also in the community. So we're collecting information such as like medical claims data that is aggregated and de-identified just for the record, um, health and well-being information, which uh, maybe are some services that may be, be performed at the health center like biometrics. Um, maybe there's some activity challenges that we are collecting some data and information on. And then the community feedback and integrating all of that along with consumer engagement data. So what we try to do is then pull all of that information together, analyze the information for trends and insights. Uh, we dig into that information until we, can until we can determine if there's a story that needs an ending. Um, meaning, once we identify a problem and understand what the desired outcome is and how that aligns with the campus goals and objectives, we'll look for solutions that can be created or implemented to aid towards that desired goal. So a lot, of, a lot of words there, but when you see the data actually come together in a meaningful way and you start to be able to identify these trends, it allows us to take action. You know, that's pretty cool stuff, but um, you know, can, you give, uh, can you give the crew an example of what this may look like? Um, sure, There's, uh, there is one quick example that comes to mind. Uh, one of the campuses that we were working with had a growing population of international students. And the students were coming into the country without having appropriate medical coverage uh, to cover some of these expenses that were being incurred in the community. And the local hospital actually came to the university and reached out to them kind of expressing their concern over the financial burden that was being placed on the community and that was going to eventually trickle down to the rest of the, to the, rest of the residents in that community. And so um, the university being a good community partner uh, pulled together some internal resources and external resources and we got together. Um, that did include Haran. We were at the table and they were asking for recommendations. And so we came up with an idea and a solution that the following school year, all international students were mandated to have the student health insurance coverage. So before they could come in and have a, maybe a limited coverage, but now this was a much more comprehensive level of coverage that significantly was able to reduce the burden on the hospital and also on the community. Yeah, that's a great example. And I know every college community is a little bit different, whether it's in metropolitan areas or rural areas. So uh, that could that could that could affect a lot of colleges and universities out there. For sure, um, you know I can, you know I'm a data geek, so I can probably give you stories all day long. But I know that we have limited time, so we can always come back to this one at another another day and another time. <laughs> yeah, but Chris, it's uh, it's all the information that we're gathering that you know this intelligence gathering that is uh, is helpful, but you know, the key is engagement. So I can get put together all the different ideas and solutions that are out there but, and identify what all the right sources and resources are to achieve a campus of health. But unless we can get the stakeholders to engage, that's just not gonna be effective. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right, Karen. And, um, you know, for the population out there, so you're probably, you know, have been thinking, where are they getting all this data? Uh, you know, who are they working with? So. We want to introduce uh, you to our proprietary partner, EdLogix. Um, what's really cool about them is they're an educational-based consumer engagement company uh, that provides in a, in a innovative health literacy and learning management solutions uh, to not only colleges, universities, but to employers, to health plans, um, you know, to the government. Um, they definitely transform the way consumers and students learn about issues impacting their health. Um, you know, obviously through game-based learning, there's, uh, you know, definitely a personalized user experience. Their focus uh, is definitely on improving health literacy, driving positive behaviors by educating students in a fun and engaging ways. And, um, you know, key features of this platform, um, there's quizzes and challenges, uh, there's game-based learning. And for folks that want to see it, there's really robust reporting and analytics that you just saw a little bit of it, you know, just to name a few. Um, you know, what's really nice again is you can use this uh, on tablets, phones, computers. Um, there's some gaming samples here that you see. You see that factor myth. We kind of played off that a little bit. There's a drag and drop. Um, you know, there, there's getting students in any way you can 
uh, to again, before, like I said, get that snackable content that we discussed earlier. Yeah, you know, um, EdLogix uh, is an organization I've been familiar with for a very long time. They are nimble uh, and they can build the content that meets, you know, that meets the needs of the university or the employer, whoever they happen to be working with. But some of the reporting that we were referring back to earlier, some of those statistics that showed and measured our learning um, and the confidence levels of those who were taking the quizzes is, is direct data that we received from our, from our partners at EdLogix. Yeah, so we wanted to take the next couple of slides just to kind of give you a snapshot of what you may see or what a student may see while they're using this, uh, this platform. Um, you know, remember, they're supposed to be fun and engaging. You know, the platform uses forms of games you might recognize. Um, scratch ticket, who hasn't had a lottery scratch ticket before? Um, pyramid, spin the wheel like Wheel of Fortune. Um, it's uh, over and over. They are, they're very, very uh, interesting and they always are creative and top of mind on their platform. Yeah, it's the, it's the content that is so important because, you know, as you were mentioning earlier, Chris, about this forgetting curve, you know, there's a variety of different topics, but the way that the questions are asked allows it to be fun, but also it can help you if you miss a question, they can come back and ask you a question maybe in a different way to help, again, create that, create that pattern and that um, kind of that uh, memorization that is going to bend that forgetting curve. Well, and again, with that forgetting curve, with looking at strengthening that muscle, that brain, um, you know, as we mentioned earlier, um, you know, also competition. Uh, this Gen Z loves competition. They love life balance. They're always connected. And uh, this technology from EdLogix has it all. A couple other things you'll see, uh, there's daily engagements. Uh, this is, you know, weekly engagement strategies. Students can engage as much or as little as they want. You know, again, the, pl the platform is, is very nimble. Yeah, some of the engagement strategies, you know, that you can see here, one is the weekly polling. And I think it would have been a very interesting as we were, you know, facing this whole uh, coronavirus crisis is to f understand, you know, how are the students feeling? What are they concerned about? Um, this, the polling would have given us some insights into exactly that. Um, the, the newsletter, what a great way to communicate. Again, just having faced this crisis that we are in the middle of right now, uh, what type of, you know, information is coming out on a daily basis. So where is a great platform to be able to learn a little bit more about what's happening? You know, the other thing is the notification center. Uh, this is a fantastic communication platform that for universities, you have a lot of platforms now, but this can either be standalone or can be integrated into an existing, an existing platform that you have. You know, as I mentioned before, uh, EdLogix is very flexible, very nimble, and, and uh, you know, there to continue to create the right content. The monthly strategies are really a little bit more, you know, can be a little bit more focused. Um, they are, again, repetitive, uh, there's different challenges, uh, but it gives you the opportunity to be connected on a regular basis. So again, those are the important things is how frequently can we get you to engage on this site? Um, some of the ways that the incentives are out there are, you know, you can see the, the health scratch drawings. Uh, again, competition, how many points are you earning so that you can have more chances to win uh, some type of prize, reward, or an incentive. Uh, these are all different techniques to improve and maintain engagement. Yeah, what's also great is uh, what Haran has done is, is put up some money to these, uh, these students can actually win uh, monetary rewards uh, by, by doing certain things. And uh, they're always wanting to get a little extra money in their pocket. So that's another piece of this that, that, that they like and enjoy. You know, we talked about how quick they could, they could, turn, they could turn around. And obviously, all of us across the country and the world are affected by this coronavirus and they were quick uh, to, to get stuff up on their platform to help understand what the do's and don'ts are. Again, Karen already mentioned about that notification center, about the weekly polling and those type of things. You know, they're a great tool for education along with well-being information. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff that you saw, biometrics, activity challenges, community feedback, you know, integrate along with consumer engagement data. 
Now we analyze all this information looking for trends and insights. As, as Karen said, we're both kind of data geeks and we dig into the information, you know, until we determine if there's a story that needs, uh, you know, a beginning and an ending uh, and maybe be able to identify maybe what resources they may need through their learning. You know, meaning once we identify a problem, understand that desired outcome, we look for the solutions uh, to aid toward that desired goal. So what would be some examples? Yeah, there, there's a, a couple of things that we would like to, to use as a follow-up. You know, again, um, Haran has a, a landing page that has a lot of information on there related to all of the updates uh, related to the uh, COVID-19. And uh, EdLogix has also just released some information. And so we can, we'd be happy to use that as a follow-up if it would be of interest to the, to the audience. But one of the things, again, that we are, you know, as we kind of just kind of recap some of the information that we're talking about here, you know, the integration of a healthy campus uh, outcomes, it really goes back to those four components that we had talked about before. Uh, it's understanding your stakeholders, internal and external, it's taking that data and compiling it in such a way and looking at it that it's going to be able to create the experience that the campus is looking for. And, you know, the goal is trying to improve uh, health uh, and health care. And if we can do that through gamification in a fun and engaging way, uh, those are the types of actions that we really are focused on. And we have seen it come together um, in a very neat way. So those are just a, a few of the ways that we are thinking about, again, you can obviously work on any one single component, but when you put it together, it does tell a very different story. You know, speaking of actions, like you talked about, let's talk about actions and how they could drive results. So hopefully I know what you all are thinking. This looks super cool. EdLogix is definitely cutting edge. And, you know, I want a total campus of health. How could this be incorporated into my campus on a variety of fronts? You know, how do you implement solutions to instill that total campus of health? So as you've heard, there are lots of moving parts, a lot of stakeholder buy-in, but I'd like to share with you an amazing case study that Haran has with a fellow BHAC member uh, that we completed with one of our large university clients in Ohio. We're implementing a logic with just one piece of the puzzle. You know, we did a lot of things for that university on the student health piece, uh, a variety of strategies to leverage the funding of the student health insurance program. You know, we ease the administration. We know university budgets are tight. We improve the health and health literacy of the student population uh, and we enhance the efficiency. So um, basically, if we go to the next slide, um, you know, we have a, some, you know, a case study uh, that I talked about. Um, about 25,000 students at this Ohio public university. And we basically had four goals. Uh, and I'm gonna go through each one of these with an outcome, you know, Goal number one, we, we wanted to offer a low cost, high value student health insurance plan. We basically, what we did with this is we leveraged the RFP and market bid process uh, to provide an annual cost savings of over $450,000 for the student population. And this was by golly without actually changing plans or the insurance carrier. So going into plan year 2021 uh, in August, uh, each person, each student who actually, um, you know, selects the student health insurance plan is actually going to be paying a little under, a little over $100 less a year for the same exact plan. So we thought that was pretty amazing. You know, again, reduce administrative burden of the staff at the university. You know, we know, again, that the university budgets are tight. You know, some don't even have a dedicated person or a unit that takes care of student health insurance. I know it's kind of wrapped out different colleges, universities of how they're doing this. You know, with this process um, and this leverage, we were able to negotiate an on-site coordinator um, that was a carrier, insurance carrier uh, employee, and it was not no cost to the university. Again, not hitting their budget, um, which was awesome. Uh, the timing on this actually was impeccable. We did not know this, but the person who actually, there was one person at this university doing this for over 25 years was actually moving to a different department. Uh, so it was actually very, very nice for the university. Um, number three, improve student health literacy. You know, this is where uh, EdLogix comes in. You know, we implemented that gamification platform. Also is carrier funded, insurance carrier funded, no cost to the university. You know, we've obviously talked at length about the strategy of the 
in the past slides during this program. But what's really cool, uh, we're gonna try to take it up to another level going into plan year 2021. Uh, we're trying to incorporate EdLogix into the overall enroll and waive portion of the student health insurance. Uh, that would mean engagement in um, a huge piece of the, the population, not just the population that's signing up for the student health insurance. So stay tuned on that one. Um, final piece, enhance efficiency. So, you know, everybody's trying to be more efficient in your role on campuses. Um, you know, with having a main campus and two regional campuses at this university, uh, they needed um, a way for all the students, not just the main campus, but all the students, including the regionals, to have access to care and supplies that were not just a part of the health center on the main campus or at campus markets where they actually um, might be buying from their peers. So uh, Haran, along with this carrier partner, you know, proposed over-the-counter kiosks through CVS that to be placed on each campus, again, at no cost to the universities. These particular vending machines, per se, are usually about $2,000 a month, um, and the, the, the carrier was willing to pick up that cost, uh, and they're designed to help maximize you know, convenience at any time of the day, no matter if it's uh, in the middle of the night or not, and meet students where they are with the on-the-go wellness solutions, you know, outside of the traditional retail space. You know, of course, we have uh, just a kind of recap a little bit of where where Haran is and, and some of the things that we are doing. We're really, again, the consultants that are bringing the strategy and trying to help connect all of those different dots. Um, you know, we're providing the, you know, helping with the insurance, the component of that, uh, making sure that the students have the right coverage and that employees have the right coverage. Uh, we're helping with, you know, wellness. Um, and again, bringing in the right resources or at least evaluating the resources and closing any gaps that might be there. So much of this is done through data analytics. And that's where the EdLogix has come in and they have helped us not only um, collect some of the information, but then again, to continue to be able to gain feedback uh, to make sure that the resources that we are bringing into the campus are the right resources on an ongoing basis. Uh, you know, again, that's just one component, but the, you know, the strategy, I think, is the key in pulling all of this information together. And uh, we have a few testimonials for some of the, some of the work that we've done and some of the resources that we, we have brought, um, and along with some of, the, some of the work that EdLogix has done. So obviously we're not gonna read those to you, although we would love to because they say really nice things. Um, but, uh, but again, uh, this isn't uh, the first time that we have done this and the passion and the energy that we have to put towards a campus is hopefully something that would help uh, each university meet their goals. You know, one thing we always talk about when we're talking to the universities that we work with and our partners is every decision we try to do, we try to see if it's best at the student's interest uh, outside of anybody else's. And that's really hard to do and that's a lot to get to get buy-in on time, but we are really student focused to try to figure out, all right, are we gonna do this? What is the best, uh, you know, is this in the best interest of the students? Uh, and I think our university counterparts really like that because uh, not everybody's doing that in this day and age. Um, you know, so if you're interested in it at all, you know, we'd love to help you reach your goals with this as well or answer any questions uh, that we have with you. You know, so we definitely look forward to connecting with you. Um, you know, feel free to call us, just not all at once. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we were, had a great opportunity to present in front of you uh, and, uh, and look forward to talking to you soon. Yeah, on behalf of uh, Chris and myself, we just wanted to thank, uh, to thank our audience and thank BHAC uh, for the time and the opportunity to speak to you today. And we're happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Thanks so much, Chris and Karen. I sincerely appreciate you presenting this information. And uh, for those of you um, watching the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to um, add them and insert your questions there in the chat room. And I will, I will take care of that and um, pose those questions to Chris and Karen. And um, if you don't mind, I will start with a question. <laughs> so, you, you talked about um, in this fully integrated approach addressing um, you know the the multiple 
areas and the, the campus resources and the community resources being an, an important part of that. So do, do the students, do they have access to or do they get pointed to, to these resources directly through the EdLogix platform? Actually, uh, Kat, there's a couple of different ways that we're doing that. We have, um, we have done it <clears throat> through, an, through our an insurance company carrier partner uh, in one situation. So we've actually built, we're building the bridge so that when they go in to either enroll or waive in the student insurance, they are automatically introduced to EdLogix in that way. Uh, so that was one way. The other things and resources that we've been using is the, are the health centers, uh, if one is available on campus, um, and also using the counseling centers and the student life. Uh, so there's a number of different ways that we're trying to connect. We've, we've used some of the, um, some of the, some of the Greek um, this, uh, organizations to, to help us get the message out. So a number of different ways that we are trying to connect with all of the students. You know, to answer again, Kat, you know, do they get automatically through EdLogix to a particular resource? Necessarily not to my knowledge, but what I would tell you is what's really nice about using EdLogix is the, 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 the university, if they want something that the students, they want the students to know, they could put banners on there. You know, if they're looking at something or if we're looking at the data and we see a lot of students are involved in a particular condition that, that we might be able to put, you know, some things on there to, 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 to put, uh, to help them get to where they need to be and those type of things, if that's what you were asking. That does, that, that is what I was, what I was getting at is um, what, what campus or community resources do they get directed to through the EdLogix platform? Yes. So again, a lot of that is campus-based. So uh, depending upon the strategy of the, of the campus, um, we're generally working a lot of times with student life. Uh, they may have a health center and they would say that based on, you know, this information, we would like those students to be redirected to the health center. Um, you know, for example, if they are curious about the, um, you know, colds and flus and where do they go for care, things like that. Um, mental health services, uh, they may, the, the campus may be able to direct them then to um, directly back to the health centers or to the most appropriate resource, but that is based on, that is really the call of the, of the campus on how they want that, but it's, we, there's flexibility there is, I guess, the point, the main point. Excellent. Um, one other question that I have, how often do you recommend the um, institutions um, checking in or analyzing the data that is collected um, in order to to tweak or to make changes or to to add to the, you know what their program is. Yeah, we get the data on a monthly basis, but we found that looking at it and reviewing it more on a quarterly basis makes a little bit more sense. Uh, unless there is something that really pops out at us, and then we have the ability to take action right away. Um, we have one comment um, from one of our viewers. Um, I think your idea of using the Greek, the fraternity and sorority system included is a wonderful idea. Most Greek organizations have requirements of members receiving health education, including mental health. Um, Karen or Chris, can you fill us in just a little bit on um, how you worked with the, um, the Greek system, at, at least at Miami? Sure. What we had done is we had represented, uh, the representative from the Greek organization that worked with us to, we presented different challenges. And part of it was the registration, making sure that people registered on the site. Um, and then the more people who were registering, um, there was the rewards and incentives that Haran had created for these groups. So there was a bit of a challenge that they had they, between each of the organizations to see who could get the most people to, uh, to engage. And as a result of that, again, based on the points uh, that the, each organization was scoring, 
they could determine how many, how many chances or opportunities they got to for the incentive prize. All right, um, we have another question. Um, the question is, how can this be useful to community colleges? Um, would I assume that perhaps um, some of the pieces or some of the approaches would be tailored or would be um, adjusted somewhat if, if we're specifically talking about a community college? Yeah, it's definitely um, with regards to uh, it's definitely unique to each school. Um, you know, one thing, uh, this isn't only for, you know, students that uh, that live on campus. Um, you know, it's not only students that are on the student health insurance plan. Uh, it's for all students, whether they be commuters, whether they be living on campus, whether they be part time, graduate, undergrad, whatever you may be. Uh, so it's very, as uh, as Karen said, very flexible. Uh, trying to meet the needs of that particular college or university. Uh, as we know, when you've seen one university or college, you've seen one. Uh, so definitely uh, would be definitely customizable. We have another question. Um, I'm assuming this question is really about um, uh, diversity is how are you address, addressing um, students of color through, through the EdLogics? Um, platform or it is again are your um, the, the data um, you know approaches um, different um, when you're looking at um, issues of diversity we it depends on how much flexibility the university gives us in terms of how the data gets broken down um, a lot of times uh, quite frankly it has we have not broken it down um, in any type of diverse manner. It's, it's a little bit more generalized right now, uh, but most of that is because of uh, the university and not, not us not having access or the ability to really uh, to dig into that. That's been our experience so far, but there isn't anything that says that we cannot uh, request a little bit more information in a student's profile that would help us to, uh, to uh, segregate or and then aggregate that data a little bit differently. Okay. Yeah, because you have to remember this, this, you know, EdLogix is not only just used in colleges, universities, it's used in communities, uh, it's used in, in, in government programs and health plans. So there, there's, there's definitely ways that, that you could, uh, you could, you know, dice the data. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions out there from our audience? Um, I'll ask another question then. Um, Karen and Chris, how long, um, how long has Miami been, um, been doing um, or utilizing Haran and, and EdLogix platform and, and um, Obviously, you shared some of the, the testimonials, but is there any, um, I want to say, concrete results or what, what can you tell us about, um, you know, their um, health, health improvements and or their, you know, their success or their changes in their overall health and wellness at the university? Well, we have been working with Miami for about seven, uh, seven years now. Uh, both on the employee benefit side and the student insurance, student health side. Um, there have been a few changes in responsibilities. And so it's only been more, a little bit more recently, probably within the last couple of years that we really started to be able to look at a total campus of health um, with, you know, connecting all of those dots. They've been connected, uh, but in a way that was, um, you know, in a way that we weren't really measuring the outcomes in a very specific way. So with the alignment of the students and the employee uh, benefit side, um, we are starting to see progress there. We still have a long ways to go, I believe, um, because there's, there's a lot of initiatives that are going on at the university today. I don't want to speak for the university, but there's a couple of things we have done. Uh, and some of that have been changes to the health center. And so some upgrades uh, to the health center have, that have been critical. Um, it has allowed for a higher volume of both students and employee engagement. So we are seeing a lot more 
uh, utilization uh, at the health center, which we think is, a, is very much of a positive. We have the right partner there that is helping to manage that process. Um, and so we have just within the last two years have integrated in the EdLogix piece. And so again, all of these pieces are coming together and we're trying to build that story, but we're still, I would say, in the, in the early stages of seeing what the, what the total possibilities could be there. But excited about where we're going. And would I assume that you have some other um, universities that you're working with that perhaps aren't yet to um, the point where they're, they're integrating and utilizing all of the tools that Haran um, has available, but maybe are starting just with the, let's say, for instance, the, um, the insurance negotiation piece? You know, yeah. that's, that's correct, Kat. I mean, this is, it's one piece at a time. So we will move uh, as quickly as the university wants to move. Uh, and, and everyone's at a kind of a different space there. Uh, but what we are seeing is that, you know, on the employee benefit side in, the, in some of these other universities that we've had a tremendous amount of success in kind of bending that, that curve um, in terms of some of, the, some of the healthcare trends in both cost and, and utilization. Uh, we're starting to see that a little bit more on the student side. Uh, it's a little bit more challenging because you have a, a fresh group of students that come in every year, um, but we are seeing some, some definite patterns there as well. And yeah, we're definitely looking at this also with regards to, you know, community colleges, four-year colleges. Uh, we have a, a variety of, of data from different sets of these, um, not only with Logix, but just on the insurance piece, the employee benefits piece, um, so we're seeing all different angles uh, with regards to the college, uh, the college life. Yeah, there's some work that we are doing with uh, a number of community colleges right now, and we'll have uh, some bigger announcements coming out here probably in the next 30 days or so. Any other questions from our audience? Well, with that, I think that we will wrap things up. And I um, just want to thank uh, Chris and Karen again one more time for providing um, this webinar and um, uh, especially uh, doing all of this remotely since uh, we are all um, now are becoming pros at working from home, at least, at least in Ohio we are, that's for sure. Um, thank you so much. And I just want to um, remind uh, everyone that um, that is seeking continuing education credits to complete the post um, webinar survey in order to receive your continuing education credits and also that this webinar has been recorded and it will be posted on our website in in just a matter of a few days chris and karen thank you again thank you thank for you. having us